Welcome back to Following Noadon, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 27, and we have some interludes. And interludes means Tim is back joining us to talk about some uh, some strange corners of the Cosmere. And we can t- we have Pershendi to talk about this week. We have Rissin and Yim, which it's actually kind of funny because... Dawn, like the at the time we at the time we recorded this, Dawn Shard just came out, and within the context of these interludes, some of our viewers and Tim and I specifically look at these interludes very differently now. So, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If not, then ignore what I just said. Uh, What's a Dawn Shard? Yeah, don't <laughs> don't worry about it. Wait, who who is Dawn Shard? Wait, also, also, I'd like to point out before we get rolling here. Sure. I thought about this as a spell. It couldn't be a spell check, but it would be like a I guess the pronunciation for a, a character you mentioned in one of our interludes, and you said it wrong. What did I say? We have one of our characters, Em. You said like e- M or something like that it's the let the word the name is ym just uh-huh. the letters ym and i remember thinking about it a lot because they said em and i yeah. just kept thinking about that and i don't think he said it right but okay sorry moving on <laughs> i don't even think i said it at all i think you, were, you did i think did. You did. oh did i okay i mean that's what i thought it was yeah i i would have thought so too but do paul and elliot have t- two words to describe our interludes Perhaps. Um, my my two words, so they they go together, but they also work on their own. My two words are foreign relations. So we okay. have foreign, because we kind of see a lot of different uh, stuff with Risen's chapter, as well as the Parshendi is probably the most notable. And then relations is kind of like the, I was thinking about Risen's chapter or interlude. Mm-hmm. With kind of the trading and stuff as well, basically same chapters apply for relations and foreign, and also foreign relations. Yeah, you get the you get the gist. Foreign relations, got it. Mm-hmm. Elliot, I didn't ask you before we went live. Did I catch you by surprise there? Not at all. I'm I'm ready for you. Good. I'm ready for you. My my two words for this set of interlude chapters is gods and monsters gods and monsters you used monsters recently so i'm interested i did that you that you You went back to that one all right thanks for joining us tim and let's get started on this episode Alrighty, our first set of interludes for Words of Radiance. The last time we had interludes was way back before part four of The Way of Kings. We had a Zeth interlude, we had a couple other interludes as well. And we mentioned, I believe it was last episode, that Paul, you were expecting a Zeth interlude, and I guess you're disappointed. Any any first impressions there that you didn't get a Zeth interlude? I definitely am upset, in all honesty, because I, I always look forward to finding out more about Zeth. Um, it just felt like the whole interludes as a whole almost were a little, I don't want to say boring, but a little more boring because there wasn't that you know, action Zeth scene or anything like that. Sure. It's all empty um, without and, Zeth. And my biggest fear is, so I can't tell how much consistency there is in these books. We see a lot of consistencies. Like the kind of whole like book inside the book deal, and there's always been a Zeth interlude, and I'm really hoping that this isn't the new thing where there's no more Zeth interludes or no more Zeth for a while. We'll see. I was a little sad. I was definitely a little sad. Gotcha. Before we it, go ahead, Elliot. It makes me honestly a bit worried. That we didn't get a Zeth interlude simply because now I don't know where he is. We, we know he was sent to the Shattered Plains to kill Dalinar, 
So is he on his way? Is he already there? And we just haven't seen him yet. Like I, I would have actually, I think felt a little better if we'd had a Zeth interlude so that I knew what he was up to. Not having any information is, is like 10 times worse. Cause now it's like suspense. Where is Zeth? When is he going to pop up and, and start killing you mentioned at the end, I think it was the epilogue actually of The Way of Kings, that the timeline may not actually line up perfectly with how we're reading them. So when Hoyd is at Kolinar, we don't know why or why Hoyd's at Kolinar or how he got there, how long it took him to get there. And he's at the end, or at the end of The Way of Kings, Talon, I think, is who shows up. Um, and says the desolation has come and as far as we know no desolation has come yet so we don't know we don't really know the timeline of what's happening here so as far as we know Teravangian may not have even given Zeth the command to go kill Dalinar yet so good point mm -hmm. before we jump into interlude one and I actually want to talk when we do I want to talk about interlude one and four together because they're pretty they're pretty similar it's pretty easy to do that I actually want to bring up one of our YouTube comments from, I guess it would have been two weeks ago now. We got a comment from Cody O, and I'll just read it out here. Maybe I missed something, because I'm often working while watching, but did you guys discuss the reveal of the names of the Hasharan deities? If not, I do not. I do think that it could be a good discussion point for future videos. And he's right. Yasna did actually bring up the name of uh, Voronism's Almighty in Chapter 3. And I did want to talk about this, and I forgot about it when we when we read it. So two, this would have been from two weeks ago, this comment, but the, the reading's actually from a little bit, a little while previous to that. And Yasna and Shalon are having a conversation about the, the deities of Roshar and, the, and Voronism and stuff like that. And Yasna talks about how honor is the real name of Voronism's almighty. And if you think about that in the context of chapter of the name of chapter two of the way of Kings, the name of chapter two of the way of Kings is honor is dead. And you think about that as you're reading it, because Kaladin has given up pretty much all hope on humanity. It's shortly after Amram has betrayed him you don't know that at the time, but he is, he's pretty sad at the time. That's all you know. And at the end of Way of Kings, you, re you figure out that the Almighty is dead. And running, jumping into Words of Radiance, you, you now know that the, the name of Voronism's Almighty is Honor. Any thoughts on this? I hadn't really pieced that together reading the the word sections that we we did. I, I guess I must have just skimmed too fast over over that section. I, I was kind of wondering because I, I remembered honor being mentioned in in relation to the um that does bring some interesting questions maybe into the into the picture. We know that Syl is an honor spren, so that does that specifically mean that she has some kind of special link to the Almighty? Because if, if his name is Honor, are they like maybe? his special group of, of Spren or, or something like that, maybe. Lots lots of other questions kind of spring up for me there with, with that new bit of information. Paul, you love talking about Syl. What does this mean for Syl? If Honor's dead, does that mean she's not even a, a valid Spren? So I've always had this thought of she's not exactly a Spren, Right, she's something different, and we found out she's an honor sprint, and that's definitely like legit. She is an honor sprint. Um, make a major judgment. Like, Syl is definitely a sprint, an honor sprint, and now we know that she's like connected to God. I guess if mm -hmm. if you like put those together, right? Um. But I don't know. I I never thought about it that much. Uh, what I immediately thought of though, when 
reading this comment and whenever we made the connection that the god's name is honor i thought of odium because we saw at the end of the way of kings that the almighty is supposedly dead and odium killed him and so now i'm more curious about like oh I, I i feel like it's more of a stark contrast of light and dark now um and maybe sill is like an angel spren and patterns like a a demon's devil spren you know okay maybe he's from odium who knows i don't maybe yeah someone who knows more is probably gonna think that's dumb maybe but that's why we're doing the yeah. podcast is to laugh at you from our <laughs> from, from our <laughs> information that's true. yes i mean you're not wrong yeah so spren can be your angel or your devil well, so pretty much on that too, actually, it's not I have in my notes was a big question mark around the term of void spren. So in that same section of of Words of Radiance in chapter three, I, I did just find it here in, in my book. It it's the it's the same discussion that that kind of categorized spren into emotion spren and and nature spren. And I think we talked about that a little bit in our episode, if I'm remembering correctly. But yep. if you, you further in that same discussion, there's sort of Yasna kind of implies there's potentially a third category of spread and that void spread. And I don't know what that refers to at all or why that's different or if that's different from the other spread. Have we seen any void spread? Something completely different? I definitely have a big question mark on, on that term. That actually might tie into our interludes that we're talking about this week. Mm-hmm. Definitely some questions about Spren in these these coming chapters and, and specifically how they interact with the Parshendi. Tim, do you wanna do you wanna chip in here? Give us any teasers? I know you know the answer to these questions, but Yeah, I I don't think we've seen any void spren yet. Um based on a technicality, maybe. Uh, but you're not supposed to to know uh, one way or the other, right? Uh, but there are some interesting things with the way that Spren interact with the Parshendi. That um, just the further you get in, the more mind blowing it becomes, and the connections to to so many different things. I can't wait to get there um, and let you guys in on this secret that I know. You know. That's that's me with this entire podcast is kind of just smiling and nodding and be like, yeah, you'll learn eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. They don't know anything, Elliot. I'm sure it's just a ruse, just a just trying to make us feel bad. I'm sure we know everything that they. Yeah, do. Paul, you you and I were Discord channel just the other day. Shout out to our our Discord channel. Come come chat with us about. Uh, everything stormlight archives if you aren't already but you and i were were joking about kids and and they're all the you know parents reaching out and, and putting their hands over our ears so that they can talk about the real you know, important things in the world and we we don't have no idea what's what's going on at least that's that's how we feel our us yeah. newbies yeah pretty much speaking of that this episode is going to go live the day before rhythm of war comes out woohoo rhythm of war i mean me and tim yeah, are excited exciting. about I mean, you two. I'm are. so excited. I'm sure I'll get to read it two years from now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and <laughs> if you are watching and you are reading Rhythm of War, feel free to come join our Discord channel because we do talk about spoilers in spoiler channels without these two, uh, these two ears listening and reading. Yeah, we're so, not allowed. Yeah, you're not allowed in those channels. But we do talk about them and we have a lot of fun. So if you are reading Rhythm of War and want to talk about it with someone, Come join us in our Discord channel. Link in the description. Yeah, All right. It's like whenever older people spell in front of kids, as if you know. We have like... a lot of F U N in those channels. <laughs> yes, whatever that means. I can't read or spell. Yeah. W I T H O U T them. <laughs> yes. All right. Interlude one and interlude four. We can jump right in. 
we have our first look at the Parshendi. And before we really talk about it, I want to hear Paul and Elliot's first reactions to Parshendi. We get a point of view Parshendi chapter in Words of Radiance. What were your thoughts here? I think I was more surprised. I don't know if I'd maybe go so far as to say shocked, but I think I was more surprised at this than I was in the where where Yasna dies. Like I flipped the page over to this this interlude, and it, I like had to do a double take. I was like, "Wait, is this the actual Parshendi that we're we're learning about?" I've had so many questions about them, so many questions about them all the way through Wave Kings, all the way up to now. Here's the Parshendi. I'm going to get all my answers right here. Boom! It's going to happen. It was. I was quite surprised to to get a a point point of view from the from the Parshendi. I was not expecting that at all. Did you get more questions or more answers to your already existing questions? So, so as I should expect from Mr. Brandon Sanderson by by this point, I certainly have acquired more questions than I did get answers. But I did get a lot of answers. I will say that I, I actually did get quite a few answers to to a lot of my questions in these chapters. But of course, my six questions just got replaced with 10 more questions. So the question list is still growing. Before you chip in here, Paul, I will say, and this is maybe controversial, but I do know people, or I have watched videos of people who agree with me. I was very uninterested in the Parshendi when I first read them. And I know Elliot's going to think I'm crazy, but like, when I when I first read it, I was like, I I had very little interest in reading and like reading about the Parshendi and reading from their perspective of singing to the rhythm of or to the rhythm of like it. It took a while to grow on me. I do I don't mind them at all now, but when I first read it, I was I I didn't really enjoy it. I mean, what are your thoughts, Paul? How, how are you not dying to know? why the Parshendi are, are so strict. On my first read, I kind of binged the whole thing and ah. I wanted more Kaladin always. So it was just more time away from Kaladin, which was annoying to me. Like I didn't like Risen. I didn't like the Parshendi. It was just, you know, interludes, get through them. All right, moving on, blah, blah, blah. I'll worry about this later. Fair it's... enough. Yeah, that's interesting. I I also did a very much of a, a binge read my a first time through, but I had the opposite reaction of it wasn't that I didn't like them. I just didn't care one way or the other because I was going to be done with it by tomorrow. That kind of <laughs> that kind of deal. Yeah, true. I'd say that's a little absurd. Uh, I honestly felt the exact same way though. Did you? Wasn't super interested. <laughs> yeah. I, so I'll, 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 my exact reaction, whenever I found out listening that it was from the perspective of the Parashendi, I actually was like, oh my, like, I was like, that's incredible. I'm so excited for this. And yeah, it it got my hopes up extremely high. And then I didn't think it was that amazing. It was definitely good. But yeah, I, I got a little bored of it, in all honesty, like pretty quick. We learned a lot. It was a, it was kind of world building, or at least a good bit of it was. And so we learned a lot about the Parshendi. Um. But yeah, I wasn't wasn't a big fan. And there are plenty of people who agree with you that there's something about the Parshendi writing of learning of how you learn about the Parshendi in these in these interludes that isn't very appealing to some people and I don't and I can't really put my finger on it. There's definitely not any action or anything super intriguing in these chapters. I guess I've just been dying for so long to learn why I have so many why questions about the Parshendi. Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they here? Why are they different than the Parshmen? And here I finally get my answers. I think I was just so hungry for those answers. I just devoured these chapters, even though they were slow. And I, I loved every bit of it because I'm trying to learn as much as I can about the Parshendi. And this was such a cool opportunity to do it. But I, I, I could definitely see the other side of that. Of, of they're a bit slow. There's not a there's not a, a whole lot happening there. Nothing to nothing to really grab your your interest if you're if you're looking for action. Yeah, it was the forms for me. The forms, I, uh, yeah. 
I I thought it was it was really interesting learning, but it it was a lot of learning that I became kind of uninterested. And I think one of the most notable things, which I am curious about, is the person here kind of trying to discover this new form. Mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and while it was kind of interesting, I honestly wasn't like super invested. Like, oh my gosh, like this is gonna be the form that's gonna change the world for them. You know, I was like. Okay. Right. Cool. But. <laughs> gotcha. So we learned a couple things about the Parshendi. They have rhythms, which they, which they speak to. They, they talk to the rhythm of something. And they have forms, which they can take to do different, to different, do different, to do different tasks, excuse me. And right now I believe they have five. They have work form, dull form, slave form, nimble form, and war form. Mate form. Yes, yeah, slave form is technically a form. Right. It's a lack of form, right. So Oh. Yeah. So I guess I guess we named six, but slave form isn't a form, so they know five. I guess okay that that adds up then. Mm-hmm. Any any thoughts on how the how they work as a as a race the the rhythms like the world building here? Do you is this interesting to you? Is this not interesting to you? The rhythms is definitely interesting to me. It I, I kind of had two comparisons that I thought of as I was reading through these sections. I, I guess my first thought was there's a lot of rhythms like i i, sh- I should have got at least like 10 maybe 15 different rhythms are mentioned and you kind of get the impression that there's just a ton of these and i kind of equated it to thing we have as humans is like your tone of voice you know you can you can communicate things by what the, the parshani communicate certain things using a different rhythm so by speaking to the rhythm of of you know, sadness or, or happiness, they convey like a mood basically, or you can, I think she uses like reproach or, or whatever a couple times to convey, you know, I'm not very happy with you. So it right. kind of maybe if works like a, like a tone of voice sort of for, for humans, but then also because it's like a communal thing that they can all like attune to, it made me think of like radio stations and, and how one of them is like a little dial that they can, you know, tune into, you know, 107.1 and get the you know, <laughs> rhythm of of peace or, or whatever's on smooth on jazz <laughs> <laughs> right exactly you know, like, i just want something peaceful so i just the, the, the rhythm of yeah. peace ah yes here we go it was that's kind of what it made me think of yeah plot this this is actually a um a sci-fi book not fantasy <laughs> yes yeah we're suddenly we're suddenly weird what? the yep. beat there you go (laughs) so this and and the rhythms do the rhythms explain some things and and still leave me with some questions as well because this this explains how the parshendi all sing in in time with each other how they all seem to be in in sync with each other you know you can walk past one parchment that's it's humming a tune or a Parshendian who's humming a tune and then you you see another one who's humming the same exact tune and they, they can't hear each other kind of thing they, this explains it is because they're hearing the same rhythm in their in their heads they're both attuned to this this same thing which which makes which makes sense there it explains quite a quite a bit from that I think what it doesn't quite answer for me is does that equate to them being able to over distances like is this a, a telepathic ability that they have. It seems to me like the answer is no, that they're not some sort of like hive mind that we've kind of, I, I've kind of thought about before, you know, are they all, you know, thinking alike? Can they, can they think the same thoughts? It, it seems like from what we've just seen in these two, the answer to that is no, that all they're doing is tuning into the same radio station. And so they, they're getting the same beat in their, in their head, which allows them to things like we see, how do you pronounce her name? Is it Eshonai? Eshonai. Eshonai. So like Eshonai gets told by the some other people like, hey, we're going to meet 
to to talk about this and we're going to we're going to meet at the the third movement of the rhythm of peace so that they can use it to kind of like you know stay in sync with each other that way of they're all hearing the same thing so they can align you know things you you could use that on the battlefield pretty well you know at at this point in the the rhythm of you know rhythm of war maybe uh, it, on the battlefield i was wondering it, when that was going to come up <laughs> you could you could attack you know at that moment so you could synchronize some communicate that way but it doesn't seem like you know telepathy where they're talking to each other in their minds at least that's my impression so far yeah one of the questions that this kind of brings up for me on the on a rereader's perspective is okay so you know you're talking about these radio stations they tune tune into where do they come from yes good question All right, prediction time. Where do they come from, guys? I was thinking of this, and this might be extremely dumb, but I'm going to say Odium. Okay. Odium singing in the background, and they're all tuning in. <laughs> yes. He, he's got some chords. He's just jamming, you know, on his on his radio, radios that he's blaring out across the entire world. He's. Pro- I, I don't think that's dumb at all. Odium? No, no, no. All right. I'm going to build off of this, Paul. Odium has pre-recorded these songs like honor has pre-recorded the videos for dalinar and they tune in as they're going to get got it well well, well, trevor no spoilers sorry i'm just (laughs) i'm just expanding off of your off of your theory okay okay fair fair enough i'm with you totally i i think my prediction on this is i think they're coming from the origin i think Okay. We've seen mentioned a couple times the origin, which is where the high storms come from. Mm-hmm. The Parshendi seem to have a lot of a lot to do with storms. And so I think the the music, the radio stations are being broadcast from the same place that sends the high storms the origin. That's my guess. Good guess. Good guess. Yours is good too, Paul. Don't don't let me uh don't let me dissuade you. Yeah, he's trying to he's trying to throw me off because he's like, oh no, he's hot on the trail. He knows what's up. So, I really like your audio theory for a reason. We're going to talk about here in a second. True, I like it too. Thank you. Um, I have to say what. So while I wasn't super excited with these chapters, there was one thing that I found most notable, like that had me most curious in that. We know now. We know that Esho Nine knows Dalinar. Mm-hmm. She's the shred bearer that you know saw him on the battlefield at the end of Wave Kings, um, and we know that she wants to talk to him. And I don't know why. Full, well, we kind of know why. It, I, I, it's pretty safe to say that she wants to talk peace with him, but it's still like murky on that i don't know how she knows them exactly but that that's what i'm most curious about from these chapters um and when that will happen or how that might happen or what all good questions yeah when why where how who you know so yeah you do know that she wants to talk with dalinar and you assume because it's she wants peace because this entire this entire interlude, she's talking about how desolate and depressing Narok is now. They they used to have so many so many singers there and now they they don't. So she she wants the war to end, but some of her some of her fellow listeners don't uh don't want the war to end. They they want to keep fighting the the humans and they're willing to do anything to do so. Which actually, Esh and I has an interesting conversation with one of her fellow listeners about their gods and how they would happily return to their gods if it would mean them helping kill humans. And Esh and I is very much not on that train of staying away from their gods. Any any thoughts on the hints we've had here? What does that mean? So this is, I think, the crux of most of my new questions about the Parshendi is Eshonai 
and maybe some of the other Parshendi as well seem very convinced that their gods, you, you get the impression that they view their gods as evil. They're, they're terrified of their gods and they're willing to do anything to prevent their gods back. That is why, or at least that's why they claim they killed Gavilar. We've, we've been wondering, wondering the entire way through Way of Kings why the Parshendi killed Gavilar the way they did right after signing a peace treaty with them. Well, here's our answer. They did it because he was about to do something, we don't know, that might have caused their gods to turn their attention back to the Parshendi or to, to return. And they're so desperate to stop that that they murdered him, knowing the Alethi were going to come after them and maybe kill them all. And so that that's a really strong motive. That, I mean, they're willing to do a lot to stop the, these gods from coming back. They must be really... I, I mean, that seems to be in line with maybe our, our impressions of the void before we got the, the revelation at the end of Way of Kings that the void bringers are the Parshendi and the Parshman, like this is the type of you know, nebul nebulous evil that I was picturing of, of Voidbringers before that the Parshendi seems so terrified of, of this, this evil that might come back and, and destroy the whole world. But what exactly that is, yeah, questions. It seems like maybe, maybe Odium has to play somewhere in this, we, we know that Odium killed the Almighty, or Honor, I guess, is, is who he was. Is Odium their god? Is Odium who they are are scared of? Me and Trevor both agree. I'm just nodding my head and bouncing back and forth. I'm not, not yes yeah. or no. Mm -hmm. I mean, a nod of the head is usually like, yes, but in this situation, <laughs> true. I think we'll leave you in the dark. Figure as much. Amount of time. No, Read but I, I do find, find it out. an interesting. True, you're gonna run into that a lot once you finally catch up with us. Um, yeah, I do find it an interesting irony when the, the Parshendi decided to go after Gavilar because they wanted to not return their gods. And now, because of that decision, uh, the younger generation is wanting to return to the gods. It's a, a sad irony there. In Interlude 4, Esh and I, and I think Venley's in the conversation too, they mention honor blades. Are there any thoughts on honor blades and what this, what this means? Is this the first time we've We've been mentioned this. Do we know? We know that there are blades other than shard blades, but I don't think we've met any other like serious names for different blades. Yeah, I, I don't recall reading honor blades before. I'm sure someone will will be able to point it out to us if if we if we missed it before. But I think it is mentioned in Inner One briefly and then talked more about in, in four. I do have a major theory though about honor blades and what they what they might be. I'm intrigued because kind of the discussion amongst the Parshendi, they're they talk about Kaladin. They they talk about how Kaladin takes down Eshenai, how he he stabs her in the leg, you know, she's like limping still from that wound that she took. They're they're talking about oh the humans have surge binders, but then you know someone else chimes in and says, "Oh, well, what if it's just an honor blade?" Like, I'm kind of scratching my head about about that. How how is how is that similar but different than a surge binder? Why would the two be be confusable? Right. I'm, I'm really not sure there. But then the major clue that they give is they mention that well, it could be an honor blade because we left one in Alethkar that night. And that makes me wonder: Could the honor blade, could the the dark sphere that Gavilar had, that Zeth took, that he hid somewhere, and we don't really know where it is, could that have been the honor blade that they're talking about? Could Gavilar have had it? 
that's my new what if or or theory there. I, that didn't seem to make a ton of of sense that a, a, a dark glowing sphere would equate to an honor blade, but it was left there that night. True. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I just realized I was making all sorts of faces and this is also somewhat radio, even though we're putting it on YouTube. <laughs> Paul, any any thoughts for you? So my biggest thought on that uh I guess the only reason why I don't I, I really like that idea. But so you said that they're talking about surge binding right and they were like, oh no, yep. he might just have an honor blade. I don't know. I don't know what that sphere has to do with like powers though, or like surge binding and stuff like that. Um I I get that I, I like that on the We've left something in Alth card that could very well be it. Um But I don't I don't see how the dark sphere would equate like I don't know. I don't know what could fake surge binding. That that's where I'm at too. I, I it doesn't it doesn't seem to make sense that I don't know, maybe maybe an honor blade is like a type of, of shard blade that gives you similar powers to the surge bindings that we've seen Kaladin do, maybe you you don't need to have a, a spren and the abilities that Kaladin has, and you can still do those crazy things if you have an honor blade, maybe. I don't know. And and yeah, a, a little sphere and a, and a big sword don't thing, but that was, that was all I could come up with. I'm a little clueless on the honor blade, to be honest. Trevor and Tim, uh, Mind, mind sharing. I have I have no clue what it means. I have no information. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, well. Okay. It will be exciting when we find out one day in book four or five, maybe. Nice. I can't wait till y'all find out and you can tell us. That'll be so fun. Any closing thoughts on our Parshendi? One of the par points I wanted to bring up, uh, which it looks like Elliot had a note on it, was that the, the Shattered Plains, uh, they describe it as there being buildings in the center of the Shattered Plains. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if uh, Paul or Elliot had any, any thoughts on that. So there's a, there's a section in one of the interludes. I'm trying to look through my notes to see which one it is. I don't remember if it's one or four. But it, uh, it, it, it essentially mentions that when the, when the Parshendi chose to give up like their intelligence somehow to, to gain freedom from their God. They, they chose this dull form to, to get away from the control of their, their gods. They chose to live in the ruins of an old nation. That was the, that was the quote from the, from the book. And it just got me thinking, we, we saw recently Shalon and Yasna talk about the link between Urethiru and the Shattered Plains. And somehow the two of those are, we don't know how. We just know that sh that Yasna was was going to go there and try and discover more about that. So that that got me thinking. Maybe the Shattered Plains left of Urethiru. Maybe the entire Shattered Plains was this huge city nation of of Urethiru, and it's it's in ruins. It's it's just kind of a desolate wasteland now, and that's all that's left of it. That that was my thought on, on that. Is maybe the two are the same thing. Any thoughts from you, Paul? Not really. <laughs> Is your theory in or on or under or anything with the Shattered Plains? That's a great question. <laughs> um, you tell us. We know that... I honestly don't know what to make of it. We know that that's where Yasna wanted to find. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where she was trying to find it. <laughs> I assume I assume we're going to find out a lot more on that with since this is Shalon's book. But I I really 
I really have nothing on it. Well, Shalon is on her way to try to figure out what Yasna was trying to figure out. So, and as far as we know, there isn't much there to figure out. It's just a bunch of plateaus. Maybe there's a couple ruins here and there, but there isn't really much there. So, just a field trip, you know, for fun. One last thought on on Parshendi, kind of back to the that they have the the kind of the the major plot point in these chapters seems to be there they're seeking after new forms and trying to discover new ways to gain back the the powers they had before or or whatever that was like and that it kind of culminates in this decision where they're going to try and unlock the storm form and it's kind of hinted that this is a really powerful form perhaps maybe like the equivalent of a of a surge bind or or even more even hinted that they think maybe storm form may be able to control high storms, which reading that made me for the Alethi. If you think about that, if, if the Parshendi had the ability to like call in a high storm at will, that would be devastating for the for the Alethi. If if the Alethi were to, you know, go out on a plateau run and a high storm were to hit them while they're, you know, half a day away from from their their safety, their security, that could decimate their entire army in, you know, like one day. That would that would end this war pretty quick if the Parshendi, you know, were to gain an ability like that. And my the the foreboding that I feel was kind of summed up pretty well in a in a quote at the very end of of Interlude Four, which I'll read really quickly. And this is talking about uh Eshenai and her her decision to take on this this responsibility and unlock this form. It says it says this. During a coming high storm, she would step into the winds and become something new, something powerful, something that would change the destiny of the listeners and perhaps the humans forever. Like when I read that for the first time, I, I got I got chills almost of, oh man, that could be that could be huge if the Parshendi become these beings that can either surge bind or high storms or it's going to be over quick if this happens right how many surge binding parshendi can kaladin take down do you think not all of them <laughs> one probably like two, two two or three that's fair oh ye of little faith <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about kaladin paul come on have a little bit more have a little bit more faith in uh, plot armor I, I said or three so <laughs> <laughs> all right we can we can leave our our new parshendi friends there for now or frenemies i suppose they are at the moment and we can talk about these other two i don't i don't see us talking too long about either of these interludes they're they're pretty short well well one's actually really long the other one's pretty short uh all right, Paul. How do you, how do you say this name? Since you corrected me earlier. So, E M here is it's just like E N, but with an M, except with an M at the end. Yeah, E M E M. Um, and this was actually my favorite interlude out of the four. Okay. Um, I think it raised the most questions for me, and I was the most intrigued by. Maybe it's because it was kind of the most new and puzzling one um our other interludes well like we have a repeat character in risen and stuff so this is kind of the new fresh interlude feel i guess in these um and em is an interesting old fellow that i don't fully understand but he seems to have surge binding powers or has a spren his sprint kind of gave me some Sophrena vibes. I guess she, it seemed a little, you know, like whimsical and mm -hmm. confused. I assume all the sprint are kind of that way, a little confused, but um, it, it was interesting. I thought this one was really, really cool. I don't know what, what Elliot thought about this one, but it was personally my favorite. When I, when I read this one for the first time, I specifically remember not thinking about surge binding at all. 
and there are tons of clues and I don't know why I didn't pick up on it but I was just as naive as the little boy who gets his foot get gets his foot healed he's just like oh yeah that that ointment that you used was really effective. I was like, yeah, okay, ointment effective. All right, moving on. I <laughs> It totally went over my head that this guy was probably surge binding. But, uh, yeah, anyway, Elliot, what were your thoughts? I, I took two things away from, from this interlude, and the first was this guy's surge binding, which I just took as another example of surge bindings becoming more common. We've seen the, the a couple references now to when installations come there's a a a surge of surge binders if you will a bunch of you know new people start gaining this ability but this guy i remember if he's had this ability for a long time or if he's just gained it you know recently but he he's clearly surge binding and using a, a healing power similar to we've seen kaladin heal himself i don't remember have we seen we've seen him heal other bridgemen right with his his powers not just himself. I don't or... think with his powers. I don't believe so. We we saw in the Dalinar, like, um, flashback vision high storm. Yeah, yes. it was a vision um, where he's fighting off the essence, the night essence, and then the the night's radiant people come, and one of them heals someone. Like, boom! Like zap, you're healed. One of them heals. <laughs> one of them heals Dalinar. He's yes. he's protecting his his wife in the vision and his his daughter mm -hmm. and he gets like his back is all flayed by the midnight essence and the knight's radiant walks over and is like yeah you're fine and then Dalinar yeah. is fine and goes and keeps fighting so we have seen this before but not any time recently Okay so that that clears things up for me a little bit because I'm trying to I'm trying to piece together is this healing power one of the one of the ten surges or one of the the ten surge bindings. It cl clearly, it is, is it one that Kaladin you know has. It can we start to guess that's one of his abilities? Sounds like perhaps no that that Kaladin does not have that healing ability, but this guy does, and that that night radiant from from Dalinar's old vision did. So okay, starting to starting to learn a bit there. And then he gets killed. And then he gets killed, which is the second thing that I took away from this uh, this guy that shows up to kill him with a shard blade. I'd like to just say, when I first started Way of Kings, I got the impression that shard blades were supposed to be super rare. A lot of people have never seen one in their entire life. They they are really hard to come by. Only the, the princes and kings of the land have one. We've been seeing a lot of these things start to pop up, you know, here and there you know some random assassin guy has one this other random assassin girl has one now the now this guy in this you know black and silver uniform has one they're all over the place got some black market shard blades going around right and uh yeah i mean we did see how many they were like armies of them back in the day you know right that's radiant and stuff so i guess it's I don't know, maybe a lot of them wound up in a lot of different people's hands that kind of keep them. Or, or maybe some of these other ones are like uh, Azish knockoffs or something like that. They're, they're not the real thing. And maybe this is like just the... an honor blade. It's like fake or whatever. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like it just seems to be a shard blade. If you think about it, though, don't like it'd be pretty hard to keep track of them all because, I mean, they only... They only appear when the bearer wants them to. It's not like something you can really keep track of. If the person doesn't want you to know they don't have a shard blade, they're not gonna they're not gonna let you know. So I did notice though, and not on my first read through. I noticed this. I, I didn't notice this until my second read through. We've seen this guy before. This this dark man in the the black and silver with the with the shard blade, and I couldn't remember at first where where we had seen this guy it took me a little bit of thinking and a little bit of research to find him but he is in the prologue of words of radiance in in the scene where where yasna is walking down the hallway and she bumps into two people that are kind of you know rounding a corner and she overhears a little bit of a conversation this guy matches the description of one of those guys in that uh, in that 
in that scene. One of them is described as a tall Azish birthmark on his cheek wearing black and silver, which aligns with the description we get in this interlude of a guy dressed with a white scar or birthmark on his cheek. I don't know who this guy is or why this guy's important, but we've seen him twice now. I'm impressed. I definitely did not catch that. <laughs> but that, I didn't that catch it on my first time through. Questions for me. I definitely. So that was my big question: is why does this guy want to kill Ian? Like, is he just out to silence like new surge binders or old surge binders yeah. or something? Um, there was a lot of allusion to sound like past crime so worst case scenario for my mind it could have just been like a, a coincidence um but it's definitely not um my only thought was so there's this whole ring that capsule was in i, I oh like yeah ghost but bloods? the ghost blood yes mm-hmm. That's my only thought as to what he could be, just because they seem to be kind of trying to to kind of... They seem like a, a big group of antagonists that would do something like assassinate a, a known Surge Binder or something. Um, that's a good thought, actually. And so we, that's, we've learned that's that... That's really my only guess. Yeah, we, we've learned that they had... They at least had a, a soul caster in their, in their possession or, or the ability to or the knowledge of soul casting we even theorize in the in the past perhaps they could be the source of of shallan's shard blade or you know perhaps that the theory might run of shallan got her shard blade from her father who perhaps was a ghost blood so to 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 theorize that this guy with a shard blade is a ghost blood doesn't seem like that far of a of a stretch to me i think the only thing might go in a different direction is this guy the mark on this guy's cheek it's like in the shape of a moon, I want to say it was. Yep, it's a crescent. Like a crescent? Yep. Whereas the, the ghost bloods had a very specific different symbol. They had like a some sort of like set of diamonds or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's say this guy doesn't have that mark somewhere, but this guy this guy's mark maybe doesn't seem to line up with the ghost bloods, but I like that thought a lot. Can I read Granted the... Go ahead, Tim. Oh. I was gonna say, uh granted it does say it looks like it might be a scar or birthmark. Yeah. Uh, so it's possible that he's got uh, the the symbol tattooed elsewhere on his body. Right. Can I read this part of the prologue where we see this uh, this guy? Go for it. This is from Yastin's perspective, obviously. Rest in peace. Words echoed in the hallway, coming up from ahead. I'm worried about Ash. You're worried about everything. Yasna hesitated in the hallway. She's getting worse, the voice continued. We weren't supposed to get worse. Am I getting worse? I think I feel worse. Shut up. I don't like this. What we've done was wrong. The creature carries my lord's own blade. We don't have to let him keep it. He... The two passed through the intersection ahead of Yasna. They were ambassadors from the west, including the Aesish man with the white birthmark on his cheek. Or was it a scar? The shorter of the two men... He could have been Alethi, cut off when he noticed Yasna. He let out a squeak and then hurried on his way. The Aesish man, the one who was dressed with black and silver, stopped and looked up, looked her up and down, and he frowned. Is the feast over already? Yasna asked. Her brother had invited these two men to the celebration along with every other ranking foreign dignitary in Kolinar. Yes, the man said. His stare made her uncomfortable. She walked forward anyway. I should check further on these two. She'd investigated their backgrounds, of course, and found nothing of note. Had they been talking about a shard blade? He squeaked. I don't know why I thought that was really funny. (laughs) My favorite is when they're talking and they don't know her. she's there. He's like, am I getting worse? We weren't supposed to get worse. I feel feel like I'm getting worse. And the other guy's just like, shut up. Just... (laughs) (laughs) So yes, we have seen him yeah, before. I'm, I'm convinced that's the same guy. I don't know who he is or why he's important, but if we've seen him, tw- 
Now we've got a couple interludes in the in the past or other cameo type characters that have come in and, and have left and have seemed of no importance. But the fact that this guy's appeared twice now makes me think he's more important than just your your passerby. So now I, now I'm intrigued. Yeah, I would say keep your eyes open. Um, a lot of a lot of little things I missed in my first several read throughs because I wasn't focused on details. And I mean, I don't have to tell you guys to keep your eyes open. You're doing a very good job of it, picking up a lot of details. But just encouragement there. Alrighty, to close out this episode, we get to talk about Rissen and. For Tim and I, and for a lot of our, our listeners, or a good a good portion of them at least, Dawn Shard just came out, and Dawn Shard, minor spoiler, is about Rissen. And we get to read about Rissen and figure out that she goes to the Reshi Sea. I have I have mixed feelings on this this interlude, which I'll talk about here in a second. I'll leave it there for a second. Uh, what what were your guys' what were your guys' thoughts? Go for it, Paul. Okay, so first off, there wasn't quite enough evidence, or maybe, but she might have been riding up there with Ishik, or it seemed like someone like related to Ishik. He didn't talk about it. it was like a Man from the Pure Lake. It, 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 I got Ishik. I thought of Ishik immediately whenever they're riding in the little boat uh-huh. over there. Um, Ishik would probably be up to something more important. I don't know. Anyways, um, this interlude I, I, I thought was super interesting. And um, we learn a lot about this kind of weird group of people. This is why I had foreign as one of my words, because they definitely like walk to the beat of their own drum Uh and do things in weird ways. And so she's sent to, you know, make a trade or have some foreign relations with uh, these people. And, I don't fully understand why it's important, but it was an entertaining interlude. Yeah, this chapter was one of the main reasons I picked my words gods and monsters because we we see in this chapter a a big monster who is a god, basically, this moving island that's this massive great shell that's so huge he's his own island. Pretty yep. crazy. I you thought the Santhids were big, right? Yeah, you thought Santhids were big. You thought Chasm Fiends were big. This guy's massive, but yeah. Overall, I didn't take honestly a whole lot away from from this interlude. It was, as you mentioned, one of the longer ones here, and and ultimately not a ton happened. I I, I probably enjoyed this one the least of the 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 four of these. I, I found. Being completely on risen, a little, a little obnoxious, a little ob- annoying. I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough of her. We, we saw her once back in, in Way of Kings, and she was fine. And and here we are in Words of Radiance, and again she was fine, I guess. But I was a little annoyed. She's Shalon too. <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of the vibe I got with her. <laughs> if Shalon's um, not going to be annoying in this book, somebody else has to be annoying. <laughs> Well, it's not for the annoying part, but just like her personality. She's sent there and she's like got this can't take no for an answer attitude, which is very Shalon esque, as well as kind of just going wild to, to like, you know, she basically offers to sacrifice herself to, to like make a trade. It, it was, it was very Shalon esque. <laughs> And it was even it even felt like a world building chapter. It was just yep. This is the new Shalon. Shalon's gotten cool now, and this is Shalon two. When, I, when Shalon three will come out, 
<laughs> we'll find Chalon three later down the down the road. Yeah. No, I, yeah, that some of my thoughts pretty well there, Paul. I think actually the most important part I I took out of of this interlude was actually the encounter we have with Amian that they see strung up along the the side of the road, and this seemed to be another return appearance of of a character we've seen before. This. This appears to be axes from the interlude that we we saw before in Way of Kings. May, this was not maybe to me. I mean, we axes is the only Amy, and I think we've seen, if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. And so the the description we get here is he's an Amy. He's covered with tattoos. That's about it. He mentions Spren like once, maybe as he's as he's talking. So that kind of makes me be axes because when we saw axes before he took notes on his body by you know creating tattoos and he was the one that was traveling the world studying spren and apparently he gets into these kinds of scrapes all the time so this appears to be him stuck in another position where he's been you know offended somebody and he's he's strung up or or whatnot but yeah axes where was i going with that oh yeah so actually and and all of that really didn't wasn't all that relevant what I actually keyed in on the most was his shadow. We've been wondering a bit up until now about the whole shadows go the wrong way thing. We saw in the pro words of radiance where Yasna's shadow goes the wrong way for a little bit. And that kind of blew, blew my mind of, wait a second, that breaks everything I thought about this. Cause I was just assuming that that was an Amian thing. Well, Rissen appears to also assume that that's an Amian thing. She can't even see his shadow, and yet she assumes that he he has, I think she calls it a Voidbringer shadow that that goes the, the wrong way. So so this now is kind of like the other direction. When we saw Yasna's shadow go the other way, I was starting to think maybe that's a like a surge binding thing. Maybe her Order of the Knights Radiant people do that and maybe axes is part of that same order you know something crazy like that because yasna is clearly not an amian that we'd know of and but now i'm kind of leaning back on the camp of this is an amian thing of amians have that that shadow thing going the wrong way so why now i'm back to really why yasna's shadow was was doing this back in the prologue but this seemed at least a little clue Yeah, it's it's definitely a clue that it tells you once you figure out why that happens, it tells you more about everyone who uh, both Yasna and the Amians that have their shadows going the wrong way. It tells you more about them. Um, and then if someone's shadow is going the wrong way, it can clue you into different things about them, but you're just not quite sure yet what exactly that means. That's where I'm at. Not quite sure. <laughs> so after this happens, Rissen falls off the island and she gets her fall slowed by some spren that are, are mentioned. But it's not enough to stop injury. She wakes up with her not being able to move her, her legs. Her legs have been shattered as Vistim her her bopsk, as they say. Uh, he explains to her that her, her legs were shattered, and he asks, or Rissen asks, will I ever walk again? And he doesn't he doesn't answer her. And this is this was my conflicting thoughts from earlier. I blame Vistim for Rissen's injury. He fakes. He, he fakes being ill so that Rissen will have this kind of controlled environment trade deal. He just wants her to have some experience. But she's going up on top of this huge great shell. Like, you couldn't have picked a safer environment for this to happen. Like, she's a minor. She's she's young. What, why, are you, why are you sending her up there alone and a- assuming everything will be fine? I, I blame him, honestly. I would... Curious to know your guys' thoughts. I'm definitely in the other camp of how could he have known she was going to fall off the thing? 
you know that that's just something that was so unprecedented no idea that she would even try to do such a thing as that i'm on i i'm kind of with tim here i don't i don't know what like if you sent someone you'd be like well one thing they're not gonna do is jump off (laughs) you know like maybe if another injury happened you'd be like okay like this is rough but jumping off is a little bit reckless she didn't jump off she fell off it's she wasn't intentionally hurting herself i'll i'll take the middle ground on this i think i think vistim is is definitely at fault here i mean he he faked like he was dying i mean he was like on his deathbed which is why she's so motivated to to get this done and so i i do think he took it too far and shares some blame here but I, at the same time, I think Rissen is is ultimately the one responsible. I think this was part of why she annoyed me a bit, like she did, because she's so reckless. She, the, the, what a reckless thing for her to do to risk her own life like that just to get a trade done. Like, like yes, this is big. Yes, this is is an important thing for her career and for her her business. But to to do something that dangerous, yeah. It, it she suffered some consequences yeah i do like the the character growth that it it shows here we've only seen her a few times but um she's very very selfish and then up until this point she's very selfish and um she starts making some decisions based on the fact that she doesn't want uh, this thing to to you know end his life at with a failed trade, that kind of thing. Uh, putting someone else's uh, well-being before her own, which I think is an admirable trait. Sure. And she doesn't come away empty-handed either. So at the end, Vistim does successfully trade for a dead Larkin. Um, and then the island itself grants her an alive Larkin. So she at the very end of the chapter she gets a she gets a larkin who kind of nuzzles up to her in her hospital bed it's probably in some hut somewhere but um she's she's been gifted a larkin and we're told they're extremely rare so if Vistim's willing to go all the way up here for a dead one getting an alive one is like a huge deal so any thoughts on a Larkin? I have a I have a piece of artwork, which I will put on the screen for you guys now, and I put in the Discord for you guys. This is Rissen and her Larkin. We don't know the name of her Larkin yet, but um, this is this this artist's interpretation of a Larkin. Any any thoughts? I I too got the impression that this was a big deal, that super rare thing, and for it to be you know alive larkin to be given to her as a pet or a companion or whatever this thing is going to be seemed really important i have no clue why but i'm sure it'll be important yeah i'm really curious to see what the purpose i don't know if it's literally just a anomaly like rare as to why it's so valuable or if it i don't know it grants you three wishes or something you know (laughs) um (laughs) I, I think this is really cool, though. I think this is my favorite part of the Risen chapter, and I, it definitely stuck out to me while I was listening how, like, how rare and how valuable a dead Larkin is, and she got a, a live one, and I was like, oh, whoa, that's that's really cool. I did not remember the description, so I guess it's like a little dragon bug. Um a little dragon crab bug is, is yes, how I crab dragon bug. Yeah. Yes. Everything's a crab, right? So it's gotta be yes. it's gotta be a little dragon crab. Exactly. With wings. Yeah, I just I just love that. It's you know, crab got dragons dragon. on Roshar. Can't have a fantasy <laughs> series without dragons. Yeah, exactly. But crab dragons, because we're on crab Roshar. <laughs> unique. All righty. Any closing thoughts on our four interludes all together and episode 27? 
So my my thoughts about these interludes, they were good, but as maybe my expectations were too high. I love interlude cha- like interludes, but I didn't really love all of these. So I'm looking forward to the next interludes. <laughs> Hope, you just uh, want Zeth. Hoping you for a Zeth, Zeth chapter. That's that's tr- I do want Zeth, but I these didn't feel like the normal interludes. They felt like normal chapters. I felt like I knew everyone going in. Kind of, I I love the like, oh, when is this ever going to come into play? And we kind of knew how all of these were, except Risen. Sort of. But it was like a repeating character. It wasn't. I think you get what I'm meaning. It it wasn't as like ambiguous, exciting mystery. Sure. I thought EM was though, and that's why I liked that one. I I think for me these almost felt like too important. Like some of the interludes that we saw before just seemed to be kind of whimsical. This is this doesn't really matter. You you can kind of read it and not not worry too much about it. Whereas these ones, like all of them felt like something really important was happening. Like I had to pay close attention to to find the the important pieces, whereas before you could kind of just skim f- about it. Pretty much. I really I, I really enjoy interludes as a writing tool that Brandon Sanderson has because it gives the book so much reread value that as a first time reader you're like okay this could be important it could not be i have zero context so i guess i'll never know but you do get to find out sometime and so when you do go back to reread you're like oh this happened way back here and yeah yeah i i've loved these interludes as i enjoy almost all of them uh, especially with the the rereader perspective it's always exciting to to pick out the little points and the things that I'm picking up for the first time uh, reading through this time. Yeah. Going slower with you guys. It's it's incredible. And I love it as always. All right. Any any closing thoughts? Not a ton. I feel like our scope is getting steadily bigger and bigger. The, the further we go here not not just interludes kind of widening our scope but just words of radiance as well seems to be touching on bigger and bigger concepts like here in each one of them. we we're starting to learn about you know gods and and deities and, and beings way beyond what we've seen before so we're we're getting a lot of exposure to a lot of different aspects of of roshar for sure cool all right with that we can close it up thanks for joining us tim And thanks for joining me as always, Elliot and Paul. It's my pleasure. Toodles. Bye.